PPs, welcome back to episode 34. It's TCB. You're listening to the best step yet, but you already knew that. Today, we are joined by five-star offensive lineman recruit Pierce Quick, and we talk about his expectations heading to Alabama. Then we dive into an NFC North preview and have our very first live caller drop in for some scorching hot takes. Let's get it. Peepees, welcome back. And today, guys, we have the amazing opportunity to be joined by five-star offensive lineman and Alabama commit Pierce Quick. Pierce, thanks a lot for joining us today. No problem. Thank you all for having me on. Yeah, it's a real honor. And real quick, get it? <laughs> uh, I want to I want to start out by saying that I think Pierce and I are going to be good friends because people people forget this. I used to play uh, Division One football. I was a kicker. But I mean, Pierce is going to be a Division One football player. I was a Division One football player. We can relate. So I think this interview is going to be really good. Hey, kickers are people too, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love this guy. <laughs> already, already. So Pierce, one thing I'm interested about, uh, kind of get us started, is people we see, especially recently, kind of in the in the recent future or the recent past, people kind of. Focusing on one sport early. Did you do that, or did you play sports kind of longer than than most other people? Other sports? No. So I actually uh, I played baseball my whole life. I actually almost quit football for baseball when I first went into high school. Really? So, yeah. I was a le- I'm a left handed I'm left handed, so I was a left handed pitcher. I made I was one of three guys to make the team when I was in seventh grade. So, oh, like wow. I I loved baseball, and then uh, I had a shoulder surgery my first one after my eighth grade year. I had some weird virus in my arm, and so that kind of messed me up a little bit. And then when I started freshman football, I played varsity my freshman year, and I just loved it, so I ended up giving up baseball. But, yeah, and then I, I did I threw shot put and track for a couple years too. Okay, that's really cool. Does that virus um, in your arm, does that affect you at all playing football today? No, it doesn't at all. It was, like, literally we had no idea what it was. Uh-huh. My shoulder was just hurting, so, like, they did a scope and went into it and just put me on some antibiotics. But I actually – after I tore my labrum the fourth game this past season, so I had to have shoulder surgery again after this season. And and how's it feeling now? Feeling good? Yeah, I'm back to 100 percent now. Perfect. That's good. That's good. Good to hear. All this talking about throwing, you throwing baseballs, throwing shot put. Did you ever consider throwing the football? No, no. <laughs> no? Well, actually, um, when I was a kindergartner, I was the backup quarterback. So I guess you could consider that. Okay, go back in the vault a little bit. When you yeah, enter yeah, the yeah. draft, you can enter the draft as an athlete. You can be a quarterback and a lineman. You just be versatile. <laughs> you know, I always tell people I'm a I'm a wide receiver in a lineman's body. That's hey. perfect. Yeah. Hey, you, so you got good hands then. Oh, uh, for sure. That's good. That's good. All right, taking away from the field or taking it off the field for a little bit. What do you do to like off the field with the boys? Oh, uh, shoot! Bonfires. Hmm. Go to the lake. You know, just. Anything, anything we can find to do, really. <laughs> anything. Pierce, like, that, that, kind of a, go ahead. I'm kind of a small, like, we're a big, small town. So there's, like, you know, it's a lot of people, but really not that much to do. It's just, like, you got to find something to do. Drop, go to Sonic. <laughs> hey, got to love the drive-ins. For so, sure. so I don't want to be offensive, but all of that sounded very Alabaman. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, 100%. So tell us, we're from Michigan. We don't know a whole lot about Alabama besides football. Uh, tell us about Alabama. <laughs> I caught the accent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, everybody thinks it's like a freaking foreign country or something, but it's the same. You know, it's just like accents different. The people are nicer. Southern hospitality. There you go. There you go. Pierce, would you consider yourself to be a leader on the football field? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, I, I've always, you know, my parents just raised me to be a leader, and so I always try to lead the guys and, you know, lead my team and stuff like that. So I can say, you know, I've always had that trait, and I love to have it. Do you find that's hard to do when you don't touch the football a lot? You know, you're actually not the first person to ask me that. And um, not really. Actually, I find it easier being a lineman 
because like I'm leading, you know, like as a lineman, you're leading every single play. Mm-hmm. That's Just a good point. Like, you know, you're leading the whole, the whole, th- the whole thing's off of you. Like nobody's going anywhere unless you do your job. That that's a really good point. I haven't, I hadn't really thought about that, but for sure, and you do definitely do see linemen, you know, captains all the time. So th- that's a very interesting point. For sure. Yeah. So who? So more like talking about your game. Who's the toughest guy you've ever had to block, whether it be in a game or what, or in a camp? So I'd say in a game, um, game camp overall, it was my freshman year. We had a bunch of injuries on our offensive line, so I had to start on. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hoover. I definitely know who, who where Hoover is. Yeah. Yeah, they're a big school down here. So my first ever varsity start was against Hoover. Oh my goodness. My se- yeah, my second one was against Clay Chalk School. They're another big school. In Alabama, and then my third one was in the first round of the playoffs against James Clemens. Well, James Clemens at that time had LeBron Ray, who signed with Alabama, right? Tyreek Ky- McDonald, who signed with Alabama, Monty Rice, who signed with Georgia, and then a linebacker that signed with Harvard, and they were all on defense. <laughs> and oh. so I was six three, two hundred six pounds at that time, and I had LeBron Ray the entire game. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, yeah, I'd say I had to block him again my sophomore year, and I'd say that's the toughest guy I've ever had to block. Oh, I bet I was—that was going to be my next question. You must have been pretty undersized starting against that level of competition as a freshman. For sure. So, like I said, I played baseball. So, like as a freshman, you know, a baseball guys—they don't really—they're not really thick. You know what I mean? Like I was right. a pitcher, so we ran a lot. So I didn't really have that much weight on me, and so because of that, I was a really skinny, I was tall and skinny. <laughs> Right, uh, yeah, for sure. Being only two hundred and six pounds, look at look at where you are now. I mean, come for on now. Sure. Um, one thing that I saw um, while doing a little bit of research was the letter that you wrote, kind of announcing your commitment. And I always find it interesting what players do to like announce their commitment. You might see some videos. That's kind of been the newer trend. But what was it like writing that letter? So I don't know if you know who Chris Kersinger is. He used to write for SEC Country for Alabama. He more recently just um, started writing for somebody else, but. Me and him got pretty close throughout, you know, just the um, recruiting process and stuff like that, and I feel like I could trust him. And so he actually came up with the idea, just being like an in-state kid and stuff. He felt like writing a letter, and just because of the type of personality that I have would be an awesome thing. So writing that, that was cool right there, and I I love doing that just because I did the talking, and he put it in more like a formal, you know, writing area. Right. It was really cool. It was like, it was emotional. It was more emotional than I had thought, and and that was really cool. for the people that, that haven't seen that letter, um, tell, tell them what that kind of consisted of and why it was unique. It was very early on. So why it was unique is just because, like, my whole life I grew up an Alabama fan. And so, like, when I wrote that letter, it, you know, it was supposed to be, like, emotional. It was literally a, a dream come true when I committed. So, like, I just wanted to let everybody know that. And I, you know, thanked everybody in there who had helped me out through the thing. It, it was long. It, you know, it was a longer letter. And so it had a lot in it, just, like, who had helped me get there you know, growing up an Alabama fan, going to games as a kid, and just all that stuff. In it. I can definitely hear the emotion in your voice. It's okay if you need to cry. We'll give you a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it about Alabama that drew you there? Just growing up a huge fan. You know, like I was raised in an Alabama house. Everywhere in my house we've got pictures of Coach Dave and pictures of this, you know, just everything Alabama around my house. So I was raised that way, and then not only – even, you know, put away the side that I was raised that way and that um, Alabama would be where I'd go even if I went and played football. It's Alabama. Mm-hmm. But even as an out-of-state kid, like, if you want to win, that's where you want to go. Right. they got the best facilities. Like, that's just what it is. Right. I, I did see that you also visited two schools befa- before you made your decision. It was Clemson and there was another one. Um, Mississippi State. Mississippi State. All right. So, so you went and saw Clemson. A uh, very good football program, but you still decided to go with Alabama. So I committed, like you said, really young. Mm-hmm. So I, did, I didn't visit school. I visited a bunch of schools before I committed, but the only two schools I visited while committed were Clemson and Mississippi State. And so Clemson was more just because I loved Coach Sweeney and that coaching staff there. It just like in the facilities were out of this world. It just Clemson didn't really fit me. You know, like I liked a small town, but it was kind of too small a town. All there really was was a lake. Right. So, and then uh, Mississippi State. I really liked Mississippi State. God, that was probably that was my number two school after committing. Would have to be Mississippi State. It was just like 
Coach Moorhead had just got there. He had a ton of energy. The offensive line coach was great. That was just, and I loved the atmosphere there. I actually, I liked Mississippi State baseball when I was a kid. So that was just, a, that was a great visit. It just, nothing could beat Bama. But what about them, them cowbells? I mean, those are so annoying. They are annoying, but I kind of like them. I guess, <laughs> I guess like, if I they're, I, I, I guess like if they're doing it for you, then it's good. Fair. You, you, you do know, you know why they started that? Why? So I think it was in the 20s, 1920-something, um, Mississippi State had a cow run on their field in the middle of the game. And that season, they went. Un- they had the best season they'd ever had in their career. <laughs> so it was their good luck charm. It was their good luck charm. So ever since then, they've been ringing cowbells. Pierce, my, my team actually played Mississippi State uh, last season. Uh, do you want to guess the score? Who, who's your team? Charleston Southern. Ooh, probably. Wait, wasn't that game closer? No, <laughs> no, no. Wait, I, 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 thought, play, I thought there was a small team that they played that it was kind of closer. It's possible, but it, we were an FCS school, uh, forty-nine to nothing. Dang. Yeah, and those, <laughs> those cowbells got annoying very quickly. Uh, yeah, I, I bet if you're the other team, I bet it is very. Yeah, annoying. yeah, I bet so. So we you saw. Know, I've, I've never been to a game there, but so I can't really say how much I like them. <laughs> right, right. So we saw that you plan on graduating high school early. Was that a yeah, hard so, decision for you? No, it was it was relatively easy. So ever since my freshman year, I saw some guys doing it at a school down the road from me. They were graduating early and stuff like that, and I thought that would be a really cool thing to do. So when I figured out I could do it, I, I knew right then I wanted to do it. And my senior schedule this year is now so easy. Oh, that's yeah, I bet, especially because you only have to be there for a semester. But what yeah, what do you I, think? I, I oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Stuff. Can you say that again? Sorry. I said I took so much online classes, it just made it a lot easier. <laughs> That's nice. That's awesome. So what do you think are, like, the advantages? Because obviously you're going to be on campus in January then at in Tuscaloosa, right? So I would say the best advantages are, so the, I actually get to practice with them for the bowl game and national championship. Wow. And so I, I can't. It's yeah, good that I you're can't. expecting to be in the national championship. I think that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> they've earned that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But uh, so I'll get to practice with them for that. And so I feel like that's like a big time for me. You know, like that's really the first impression that coach will get to see on me in pads just because, you know, it's different than him coming and watching my high school practice and then doing that practice. And then I'll be ahead of everybody else that's graduating on time in the weight room standpoint just because I'll get a full semester with Coach Cochran before all of them. And you get to play in the spring game as well too, right? Yes, I forgot about that. I'll get to do A-Day also. That's awesome, because I've heard, especially in Alabama, that that spring game is, is a big deal. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a huge deal, especially uh, this year, because everybody wanted to see the quarterback things, but I think, I think we've sold out most of the years for it. You mentioned the weight room. How hard do you go in there that, to make yourself unique? So I'm, I'm, I go hard in the weight room. I really, after my freshman year, when I got my first scholarship, that's, I just I bought into the weight room because I knew I needed to gain weight, so like, I, I'm one of those weird guys. I actually love it. <laughs> That's good. I I saw. I went and looked it up. The Alabama starting O line. There's not a single guy under 300, and they average 313 pounds. And what what do you weigh right now? I'm at 285 to 290 right now. So do you plan on gaining weight? No. So actually, Coach Cochran had told me while I'm in high school, he wants me to stay at under 300 at 285 to 290. He said when I get there, they're going to put you know good weight on me to get me to 300. Right. Okay. That's a good plan. Yeah. So I'm I'm good with that. Yeah. So we've talked about your recruiting a little bit, and it's it's sort of short lived. But part of the recruiting is all the ranking numbers out there, and there's a lot of numbers out there. Your highest number is on the ESPN 300. You're number four. How big How big and important are those numbers to you? You know, honestly, like, those numbers, I know everybody says this, but this is true. Like, those numbers really just don't mean that much for me. Like, it's an honor. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's an honor to see, you know, all that stuff. But once you get in college, nobody cares. For you sure. I mean? like, no, when you're in college, nobody's like, hey, how many stars were you? You know, what, what, what were you ranked? Like, nobody cares. Exactly. Go ahead, Wes. I think, I, think, I think you're right that the number, your number, doesn't matter to you. But how important is looking at other people's numbers and saying, I want them to come with me? So that's actually that's a good point. I actually, I do do that. You know, like when I'm at camps and stuff. I know, like when I was at the opening, I wish I could have gone full pads. It's a dumb Alabama rule, but every night, you know, I was like looking to see like at the guys, and I was like, all right, this guy's ranked this. I want to go up against this guy, just because I mean, you know, they do mean something. 
like you know it you know your ranking isn't like you know it's not like it just poof that's how it happened so you know the guys that are better are ranked higher and so when I saw a higher ranked guy that's who I wanted to go against right so tell us a little bit more about the opening what was that like for you it was uh, it was a good experience it was one of the best of my life but like I said Alabama has a state rule where I can't wear pads at it mm-hmm. so that really took out of the experience for me it, it I mean it it only got to face two guys the entire time Oh, wow. okay. Because yeah, we, we've heard a lot about the opening, how great of a camp it is. But like you said, that rule, it must have it must have still been awesome, but just diminished it just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it, it screwed me there. Like like you said, it was an unreal experience. I learned so much there, and the drills and stuff were great. But when it came to one-on-ones, there were literally only two guys I got to face. Ah, oh, that's too bad. One, the entire camp. Oh, gosh. So how long were you there, and you only got to face two guys? There were three Three camp, like it was three days of camps, and I only faced two guys. I, I took like twenty over twenty reps and faced two guys. Gosh, <laughs> that's wild. So I mean, I guess you kind of treated that as a recruiting trip for you. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, like we were we were learning each other for sure. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I listened to an interview on a different podcast. We won't mention their name because right. we're the best podcast. Right. Uh, but you said you have a group chat with some with some early commits that's coming into your class. Are, oh, are yeah, y'all we, are y'all teaming up? Chat. To, What'd you say? Are y'all teaming up to recruit? For sure. You know, we have a group chat. There's actually guys texting in it right now. But uh, we got a group chat, and we talk in it, like, literally every single day. You know, not even – most of it's not about recruiting, honestly. It's just, like, funny stuff, like, uh-huh. stuff that goes on with our life. But we do talk about recruiting in it. That's awesome. I, I want to bring up something uh, once you get to Alabama with those guys, and it's got to be about the Iron Bowl. Listen, I am a huge – Huge Michigan football fan. So I believe that the best rivalry in all of college football is the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry. But I believe that you beg to differ. Is that correct? I most definitely beg to differ. So so you think the Iron Bowl is the best rivalry in, in all of college football? See, it's a hard argument because have you ever been to an Iron Bowl? No. I see. I haven't. I haven't. See, and I've never been to a Michigan-Ohio State game. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, like, it, you know, we're both going to say that ours is better when honestly neither of us have been to one of those games. You're but right. The Iron Bowl is just like, like you, I'll probably say why the Iron Bowl is better. You'll probably say that's the same reason that the Michigan-Ohio State game is better. Mm-hmm. Well, but, I mean, it's, it's oh, just, go ahead. like as an in-state kid, it's like it's just unreal. It's it, You know, at school that whole week, everybody's arguing about it. Like it's, it's, it's literally a week-long thing of everybody arguing over who's better. <laughs> what do you do when someone comes up to you and says, War Eagle? I just I let it slide. I just let it go by because most of the time when they say it to me, it's just to piss me off. Yeah, for sure. So we talked about that individual game. How many games have you been able to go to because you've been recruited by Bama and all these other schools? So I didn't really. I wish I would have. Now looking at it, back at it, but I didn't really take advantage of the game visits. There's only two schools I ever visited for games, or no, three: Auburn, Alabama, and Jacksonville State. So I never really got out much for games. Okay. I would agree with you that the Iron Bowl is better rivalry. It has a name for the rivalry. The, the Michigan Ohio State game is just the game. I, I guess the the it's one the one way I would say that the Iron Bowl is better, especially recently, are the teams are more competitive. Michigan and yeah, Ohio State sure. haven't haven't been as competitive, especially Michigan. Yeah, I think that's what makes the Iron Bowl better now is because every year, like every year, that game decides who goes to the SEC championship. Well, and having something as iconic as the kick six. Yeah, like, like the kick six spiked it up a bunch. You know what I mean? Like that game, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, too, the Iron Bowl, it doesn't matter who's ranked what. Like the rankings just don't mean anything just because that's like most of those guys played against each other in high school, too. You know what I mean? So it's because it's a lot of in-state guys. So it's just it's an, uh, it's crazy. So I, just from your voice, you can't wait to play in that game. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm <laughs> stoked for that game. That's awesome. So you talked about uh, the relationship you have with other recruits. What about your relationship with the coach, uh, Coach Key, the offensive line so, coach? So Coach Key, me and him now, like, literally, I would consider Coach Key family now just because I've been up there so much and, like, hung out with him so much. He's just a great guy, great coach. Like, I love him. He's, he's part of my family. Cool. And are you just talking to the offensive linemen that are already at Alabama? Yeah, so – I actually I know all the offensive linemen now, and I've been up there so much. I'm pretty close with them, so that that's been a really good advantage too. Living 45 minutes away has been awesome. Oh, uh, that's great. Yeah. 
how involved has Nick Saban been in your recruitment? He's been really involved. So, like, that was – my parents just really bought into Coach Saban. Like, when, when they had offered me, the first time I met with him was when he had offered me. And, like, right then my parents just knew. And every time I go down there, or most of the time, he'll meet with me. And, like, my parents, they just – they love him, and so do I. So is he heralded as, as like, a football god, Little G, down there? Yes, yes. In Alabama, he is. In Alabama, like, Nick State, like, some people – Somebody was joking around, an out-of-state guy. I can't remember who it was that's playing at Bama now. He walked up to me, and he was like, man, he was like, nobody says hey down here at Tuscaloosa. He was like, it's just roll tide. He was like, roll tide means hey, bye, what's up? He was like, it just means everything. (laughs) That's awesome. So we were talking earlier about um, food and the fact that you had to put on a lot of weight uh, for when you were a freshman to where you are now. What is your favorite food? I'd have to say honey barbecue wings. From B-dubs? So good. Yes, B-dubs. For sure. Oh, that sounds so good. For me, I I can only have like because I'm a really really skinny dude. I can only have maybe ten of them. W- what are you putting down? I, I'm curious. So I go on Thursdays because it's the boneless. Of course, day, right? You know, so you can oh, get yeah. like the number, and normally I'll get about twenty four, twenty five, with it, some queso fries. Ooh. Oh, folks, Your queso fries are good. Folks, we're in, we're talking to a very intelligent man because he goes on the day you get the deal. Right. He knows what he's yeah. doing. Most definitely. And then, uh, is there a Hooters in Michigan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So on Mondays and Wednesdays at Hooters, it's buy one unlimited wings. Oh. So you pay twelve forty nine for 10 wings, and they just keep on bringing them out. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like, like you get all of your – once you get to Bama, you bring all of your friends, and you guys just, like, take them out of business. Yes. So I have a, I have a buddy – He's like 6'8", 360 pounds. He's committed to Arkansas. Okay. And uh, he ate 80 wings. Oh, no <laughs> way. 80. I witnessed it. We, we were there from probably 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock that night. Oh, my God. Was he sick afterwards? No, he was fine. You're kidding <laughs> me. You're kidding. That's just a different breed. That's a different yeah, it breed. it really is. It really is. <laughs> oh, man, I could talk about wings all day. Uh, do you like Same. spicy though? Do you like spicy? Uh, it depends. It depends, really. Uh huh. Like some stuff I like spicy stuff, but then some stuff I don't. I'm a big spicy guy. Uh, yeah. but moving on, you have the most experience at offensive tackle, but you have shown the versatility to play anywhere on the line. Do you have a preference on where you play? So I wouldn't really say I have a preference, but tackle is like you said. It's what I've you know I have the most experience there, and it's what I played my whole life. So I'm more comfortable there right now but I feel like I could definitely open up the center and guard. So how hard is it actually to snap the ball? You know, I don't know why, but it came kind of natural to me. Like, it just, like, but it's the hardest part to snap it than blocking somebody. You know what I mean? you got to right. hit yourself. you got to hit yourself in between the legs and then block somebody right after. It's not that fun. <laughs> Has anybody ever gone under center with you? No. I don't, I don't, that's, that's probably really uncomfortable. I'm there. sure that's an interesting experience. Speaking For about sure. speaking about a quarterback, I'm ready to give you the hardest question of this interview. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you sure? I'm sure. <laughs> uh, pronounce Tua's last name. Tagalavoa. <laughs> oh, wow. Tagalavoa? Tagalavoa. Yeah. Tagalavoa. If I go up to him and say it like that, he won't correct me? He won't correct you. So that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Me and him are pretty tight, so I've, I've learned it now. You and Tua or his younger brother? His younger brother, my bad, his younger brother. Okay, okay. So is he just as good? He's a, he's a good player, too, but then also, you know, my quarterback from my high school is committed to Alabama. Right, I, I've seen right. that. Paul, yeah, Paul Tyson. They're both really good players. So what do you do? Are you, are you just going to split the reps between four quarterbacks? Yeah, I know. It, it's crazy for sure. You know, and they're all really good quarterbacks. Right. They are, and they're all different. Like, and he, it's Mac pick your Jones poison. Too. You know, Mac Jones did great in a day. I know it. It's just, I mean, it, it's a it's a good problem to have. That is for sure. For sure, it's definitely a good problem because they're all incredible quarterbacks. Speaking of that, there's there's a lot of competition at the quarterback position, but Saban and Alabama get just a bunch of talent. So uh, there's always a lot of competition going on. Are you excited for that competition aspect and like earning your spot on the line? I'm I'm super I'm I'm super stoked for that. You know, just going in and you know, having to work for it again. Like, I'm excited for that. Just And every single day of practice going up against the best guys in the nation. Like, that's, that, that's what I'm excited about. 
Mm-hmm. You can't get worse. You know what I mean? Oh, right. Right. So, yeah, iron sharpens iron. For sure. So is there a possibility that you might redshirt? You know, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, we haven't even talked about that right. yet. But with the new rule, mm-hmm. you know, you can play exactly. four games. Like, I'm not a guy that, like, I'm like, no, you're not going to redshirt me, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Like, if, if I play four or less games, redshirt me. That's right. an extra year of eligibility. Like, I mean, I don't want to waste a year. You know what I mean? Like. I think that's a really advantageous rule for the players and for the teams. I, I, I think it's a great a great rule, don't you? Oh, 100%. I love it. Like, if I'm not a starter, don't throw me in random games because I'm going to complain because I don't want you to redshirt me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a guy that if, I, if, I, if I'm not going to play more than four games, if you don't need me more than four games, don't put me in. Redshirt me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm fine with exactly. that. Exactly. That's a great attitude. It, it is, and that's the attitude that you need. But there's some people... I mean, as you probably well know, that they're just oh, they're just yeah. too stuck up in the sense that you know they're too good for that. Yeah, like, and I don't understand that. That's literally a free year of eligibility. When no matter what, they're going to play the best guys. You know what I mean? Like, no matter what you say to them, no matter what they say in the recruiting process. Like, that's what you got to learn is how you know different the recruiting process is going to be than when you get there. Most definitely. So, I mean, like, I under like if I'm not going to play, then redshirt me. I'm not gonna. You're not going to hear me cry about it. Right. That's that's again, that's a fantastic attitude to have. So I'm probably gonna ask a harder question than Wes asked before. All right. Who is your celebrity crush? My celebrity crush. I would probably have to say Selena Gomez. Oh mm. yeah. That's a good pick. We've heard uh we've also heard Zendaya from, yeah, from yeah, guys. She's, she's good looking too, but Selena, I've been watching her since Wizards of Waverly. Oh, but. yeah. I, did, did you think that was a good show? I loved it. See, loved it. I know. I did too. I got flack. The, oh, recently we did, uh, on an episode, we ranked like our favorite childhood TV shows, and I said Wizards of Waverly Place. They said it was trash. No, I liked it. <laughs> Back liked me up. It. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's fair. Uh, Pierce, I'm, I've been scrolling through your Twitter. I followed you. You, you still haven't followed me back. Oh, I'll follow you. What's, what's your <laughs> I'm Twitter? Just, I just met <laughs> my my Twitter is uh let's see Wesley two underscores Eccles. Oh, Wesley two underscores Eccles. He's on it right now. Wes. Is he about to follow <laughs> me on the air? Oh, what a what a guy! What a guy! How, how do you spell Eccles? E C H O L S. That's a plug for the PPs too. I mean, our <laughs> listeners will follow me too. <laughs> it's uh. W e s l i e, it's l e y. This is great radio. It is. Eccles. Spell Eccles again. My bad. E c h o l s. It is a weird name. And then, is it W e s l e y? Yes. Yeah, there it is. Awesome. Right, I, I got you. <laughs> That's awesome. On air, on air. But while we're on your Twitter. Uh, you tweeted out something interesting. There it is. I just got the notification. Uh, <laughs> you tweeted the other day, should be a big weekend. C- capital letters, big. So what we got coming this weekend? You know, I, I can't tell you that, but it, it is going to be a big weekend. Ooh. I can say that. That's I like that. Time. Hey, we'll be on the lookout for sure this coming weekend. Sure. Um. Hey, we. I. I'm always curious. Do you have any hidden talents that you like? You don't like to share necessarily, but like something you can do pretty well. That's kind of out of the ordinary. You know, people ask me that, and I hate. Honestly, like I don't. I don't have anything like you know hidden. Like I'm a pretty open book, so like everybody knows. But I don't really have any like hidden talents or anything. That's that's a fa- that's fair. What about uh? We talked about your celebrity crush, but Alabama is infinite infamous. For the ladies. Hey, he just went on a, on a date. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm just saying maybe his hidden talent is getting the ladies. That could be. <laughs> so you never know. Watch out. Watch out, Alabama. <laughs> too modest. Too modest. But, Pierce, I think that's going to be all we have for you, man. Honestly, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. We had a lot of fun, and we hope you did, too. No, heck yeah. I had a lot of fun, too. Thanks for having me on. That's great. Most definitely. And it'll be the only time you hear this from me ever, but... Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Roll Roll Tide. tide. (laughs) Yeah. Pierce, thanks again for a wonderful interview. We loved having you. And this especially is getting our juices flowing. Why, Wes? 
because football is back. Football is back. That is right. The NFL, which is what we're going to be talking about today, they kick off in seven weeks, regular season, seven weeks. Right. So today is a Wednesday. The first game is on September the 6th, 8.20 p.m. Mm. Get your TVs ready. That's right. Because the Falcons and the Eagles are kicking it off. The football season, seven weeks away. I can't believe it. And the Hall of Fame game is next week. And then... Who cares? Preseason starts in three weeks. And then football is back. A lot of teams reported back to camp today. Right. And we're just... We're we're about to get going. Exactly. We're about to get going. And like I said, it was awesome having Pierce on. Can't wait to watch him at Bama. But guys, what we're going to do for you is we are going to break down the NFL. And how we're going to do this is we're going to do a... Division at a time, starting with the NFC North because we are from Michigan. And so we're going to take it one episode at a time. Every episode we're going to do another division. So like I said, we're starting with the North. And this is a great, great division. It is. And I like that we started with the NFC because the NFC is the best conference in football. Right. And the NFC North is the second best division in football behind the NFC South. Some may say. Yes. So let's get into it. What are we going to start with first? Yeah, so we're going to start with, we're going to go team by team first, and then we'll give you the records at the end of who we think are, are going to finish where. So what I'd like to do is start with the Vikings. The Vikings have a lot of stuff going for them from last year and new blood in the locker room, mostly the quarterback position. Kirk Cousins was signed in the offseason, a Holland native right by us, and I'm excited to see what he can do with this Vikings team. He's very similar to Case Keenum, just a lot better. Just better. Right. right. When I look at this Vikings roster, up and down, I feel like the best player in each uh, roster group, I would say, like linebackers, offensive line, quarterback, wide receivers, etc., that they have at least a top 10 player in every position. They do. And it's insane. that You don't find that on any roster. Besides maybe the Eagles. Right. The Eagles are, are right. positioned you're right. in a similar way. But I like what you're saying there, Pop. So you're saying they're very well-rounded as a team. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say looking at it from the NFC North perspective, aside from the quarterback, they have the top player at each position at almost every position on the field. So that's why we've got to pick them to win this division. Right. And, and when we talk about the Vikings, we talk about their defense, right? Yeah. And just an absolute juggernaut uh, of a defense. And speaking of new blood, they brought in new blood this year and improved the spot where they were weak in their defense. They got a cornerback. They got, um, excuse me, they got Mike Hughes out of UCF. So they're getting better at a spot where they were weak and on the side of the ball where they were very strong. So their defense, yes, they improved at quarterback, but I think it's important to look at where they came in with draft picks as right. well. Right, and they have one of the best defensive back cornerbacks in the league in Xavier right. Rhodes. Yes. Rhodes closed. Rhodes closed. Yes, he, Yeah, he is a lockdown player, and they honestly have one of the top safeties in all of the NFL in Harrison Smith. He made his first All-Pro last season out of Notre Dame, so I can't talk too highly of him. Another returning player, it's like they had two first-round picks because Dalvin Cook is coming back. Right, yeah, and they they kind of had to manage with uh, a combination of Jarek McKinnon and Latavius Murray last year, but now you have that bell cow, that big-time guy who we saw to be a really, really good up-and-coming running back in this league before he got hurt. Boys, um, I would say a lot of people are saying that the Vikings gave Kirk too much money. Mm. Do you agree? You know, I I do agree in the sense that they had a quarterback in Case Keenum. They had three quarterbacks. They had three. You're right. right. So they had three quarterbacks, Bradford, Keenum, and Bridgewater, and they let them all go to bring in a guy that isn't astronomically better than any of them. Right. So I think the money aspect is interesting. They could have gotten Case Keenum for a lot cheaper after he, you know, brought him to the promised land, so to speak, in the playoffs. Didn't make the Super Bowl, obviously. But, you know, I do think they got him too much money because the fact that they had so many quarterbacks and they just let him go. I'm I'm very okay with it because 
Um, you know, you like that from Kirk Cousins. He has a kind of a different mentality, just kind of like a baller, yeah. th- baller attitude that you need at the quarterback position. Earlier, uh, when we were planning episodes, we we talked about uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and he, how he came out and said, "I believe I was better than Tom Brady." As a quarterback, you should always believe that you're the best person on the field. Yeah. I think you need that to have a very good winning attitude on the offenses, on offensive side of the ball. I think that goes for any position on the field, honestly. Right. If you're an offensive tackle, I'm going to beat this defensive lineman every time. Mm-hmm. Pierce. Right. Got to shout him out. Got to shout him out. But, yes, like you were saying, uh, they have Kirk Cousins. It might be because of that mentality, but, boy, he has some stellar players to throw to. He's got Adam Thielen, who had just a complete monster breakout year. Nobody saw that coming. Stephon Diggs, great player. Obviously had the Minnesota miracle. Big play. That was a big play. One of the best plays I've ever seen. And then they have Kyle Rudolph, a top 10 tight end. So Kirk, compared to Washington, he has a lot more weapons. And that's why we think the Vikings are going to be the kings of the NFC North. Our combined record for them at 13-3, and if you can believe it. 13-3. and we think they can do it. Not a lot of teams are able to achieve more than 12 wins, but we definitely think that the Vikes can do it. And we want to move on after the Vikings to the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers, they've got a lot of new blood, and they have their returning king in Aaron Rodgers off of injury. Guys, what do you think that Aaron Rodgers coming back is going to do to rejuvenate, to rejuvenate this squad? I think it's going to be the same as we saw. Him winning 10 to 12 games. But this isn't his conference anymore. It's the Vikes. And he is just, he is a phenomenal player. Arguably the best quarterback. Just all around, can do it all, can on the run just fling it. But his team is not that good. That defense is poor. Mm, They're aging. Aging is probably the right word. And. They have one wide receiver. Yeah. And what running backs? Yeah, they're they're a big time running back by committee team. We saw the transition from Montgomery or of Montgomery from wide receiver to running back to kind of fill a hole. But even he wasn't that good. So like you said, they they roll through through three running backs and that doesn't often work out too well. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting that you brought up was the lack of receivers for Rodgers to throw to. And it'll be interesting to see Aaron Rodgers throwing to somebody not named Jordy Nelson all the time. Right. Jordy Nelson was a guy, when you talk about Aaron Rodgers, he's one of those guys like Tom Brady that makes receivers look really good. True. But I think Jordy Nelson was one of the guys that were actually legit, and we're gonna we probably going to see that this year when he's away from Green Bay. Mm-hmm. But they also did add Jimmy Graham. Yeah. So I think that's something that we'll see when Aaron Rodgers makes receivers look real good, he also makes tight ends look real good. Yeah, he's a big fan of the tight end, as was his predecessor, Brett Favre. It's something about Green Bay that likes the tight ends. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how that offense clicks anytime you have the best quarterback in the NFL. I truly believe Aaron Rodgers to be the best at the top of his game. Then you have a shot, like Wes was saying, the quarterback is the most important position on the field. Well, yeah, and he's someone that can win games for you. When when stuff is falling apart on other sides of the field, he can step in and win games. He can put up 14 points when they're really hurting. Most definitely. And uh, I want to allude to the defensive side of the ball a little bit. Clay Matthews is still there. Still. He's still there. He's still churning. The, the USC product is still going, but... That I feel like Clay Matthews is a perfect example of the Packers' defense now. Mm-hmm. He's a great player, do not get me wrong, and they have some great players on that side of the ball. They're just getting up there in age. Pop, you made a great point when you said it's just not the Packers' division anymore. The Vikings, they're getting younger, they're getting faster. The Packers are going in the opposite direction. They owned the NFC North for the past five years, five to ten years since Aaron Rodgers has been at the helm. But now I think we're going to start to see the decline of the Packers and start to see teams like the Vikings and hopefully the Detroit Lions uh, emerge over the Packers in the near future. That's true. When I think about Aaron Rodgers, you know, it's I think it's tough for him. He's he's been waiting for really good money. I think he should be the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. 
I think maybe he should consider going somewhere else. Ooh, that would be interesting to see. When you think of Aaron Rodgers, you think of the backers, but he could go win Super Bowls with a lot of different teams. I think a great person to bring up when talking about this is Peyton Manning. Yes. When you thought of Peyton Manning, you thought of the Indianapolis Colts. Mm -hmm. He went to Denver, got himself a Super Bowl. Right. And I don't got think... himself a Super Bowl with the team that that won the, a defense that won the Super Bowl for him. Most he really definitely. didn't do a lot of work that season. Right. I was just going to say, uh, I don't think Rodgers is going to be winning any Super Bowls anytime soon with this Green Bay Packers team. So if he was able to go to a team that is just a quarterback away, which is obviously a lot away, right? Yes. But if you're able to get an Aaron Rodgers, like we had said, good shot. You're making it deep into the playoffs. Yeah, and a quarterback can take the bi- a big chunk of what the just whatever we are away. Exactly. And. So, yeah, so we talked about the complete teams of the Eagles and the Vikings. If he can find someone that's close to that, I mean, that's a possibility to win a couple rings. Think about this, just a hypothetical. What if he replaced Blake Bortles in Jacksonville? Oh, that team would be unstoppable. I think so, too, because I think that's a team that's a quarterback away, of an elite quarterback away. Right. I would agree that Blake Bortles is a good quarterback, probably top 15. Won playoff games. Exactly. He's won playoff games. But if you were to add Aaron Rodgers to that team, I think they're the Super Bowl favorite. I think you're probably right. Yeah. Or, so, or what about when Big Ben leaves? Could be. Could be. But Aaron Rodgers, if you're listening, just think about it. Yeah, right. Aaron, we know you're listening. Big PP. But the PP Packers going 10-6. and six, That's what we have for them. I think that might even be a, just a tad bit generous, but... We'll go with our collective thoughts, 10-6 and six for the Packers, and we will move on to our hometown squad, the Detroit Lions. Not my hometown squad. Pop and I's hometown squad, even though Pop isn't really a big Lions fan. I, I, I will take it over, Pop. Yes, take over. I'm going to take over for a real But you say something. I know you want to say something. Let me just go off on a tangent real quick. Okay. I've grown up around Lions fans my entire life. Oh, well, here we go. And they are the worst people ever. They're yeah, bro. <laughs> Every year is their year after they go 8-8, eight and eight, after they go 0-16. Oh hey, I'm a Lions fan. We might win a playoff game this year. <laughs> never going to happen. They're never going to win a Super Bowl. <laughs> Nothing. It's it's annoying. It's Stafford, overrated. Oh, overrated. my gosh, the Stafford fanboys. It's the Stafford fanboys? You don't think Stafford's a good quarterback in this league? I think he has to be a good quarterback. For a terrible team, and they still don't win games. I think I think if you put a league average quarterback on the Lions, they're not getting even getting close to the playoffs. I mean, I agree, but he has to do. He's putting up these numbers because yeah. that's the only thing the Lions can do. Yep. Okay. All right. Let me go. Let you go. I want you to start with Matt Patricia. Okay. I can start with Matt Patricia, and I think the Matt Patricia hiring is huge. It's not necessarily the X's and O's that I'm as most concerned with. It's the culture to me. When Caldwell was at the helm for Detroit, it was con- he was content with getting them to the playoffs, which is what we needed at the time. We hadn't been to the playoffs in years, and Caldwell got us there twice. Now, Matt Patricia coming in, it's not good enough. Okay, They ramp him up, and there is a lot of punishment in practice. You don't see that in the NFL when people's egos are bigger than their play on the field, most definitely. So I think, starting with your question, that Matt Patricia's hiring is huge. So I, that being said, I want to start on the defensive side of the ball because that Matt Patricia is obviously a defensive coach, being the defensive coordinator for the New England Patriots. And the one thing that sticks out to me the most is that Ziggy Ansah, needs to get back to where he was. Last year, he took a major step back. He's been battling with injuries. But this man, when he's right, is a sack machine. And that's what the Lions need because their defensive backs are good. Not great, but they're good. And they have a top-five cornerback in the NFL in big play Darius Slay. So I think that the Lions, if they're able to rush the passer, it will be huge for their defense. I agree. I think the defense is a huge part of that. That uh, what that team needs. I also want you to talk about. For years, the Lions have tried multiple experiment experiments. There's been Reggie Bush and a lot others yep, I was in hit, trying yep. to create a run game. Mm-hmm. Have they done yet? So the, obviously they haven't yet, but they are definitely in the right direction. And it starts with the most controversial move of this offseason, and that was the drafting of Frank Ragnow. At number 20. 
the center from Arkansas. People are like, oh, it's not flashy. But guess what? This is what they're doing. They're starting to rebuild this defense. And this is one thing that I had written down, is that Stafford does not need to carry the entire load anymore. The fact that they went in the first round, drafted a center, and in the second round they drafted on Johnson running back, it's their hope and prayer is that Stafford doesn't have to throw the ball every play in order for them to win. And if that happens, where they're able to get three yards on first down, they haven't been able to do that. They haven't been able to, they've gotten stopped for losses or no gain on first down runs, so they had to start throwing it every time. And then your offense becomes incredibly predictable. But if you're able to have a legit play action pass with Matthew Stafford and some of the weapons he has coming back, one of them that I want to highlight is Kenny Galladay later, that I think they're going to take the complete next step if they're able to have that running game. And obviously, like you said, huge if. Huge if, and they also did add LeGarrette Blunt, mm-hmm. who's been a very consistent guy for a lot of teams. And right. he's a good three down back. What the problem is they have to be within the first down range <laughs> right. to put a three down back out there. Yeah, most definitely. And that's the thing is you can make all these additions, but you have to see it on the field. And I, I want to uh, touch on Kenny Gaude real quick because their wide receiver wide receiving core is aging so bad with Marvin Jones and... <clears throat> excuse me, Golden Tate, but then you have this second-year player in Kenny Gaudet who was hurt and showed flashes while he was not hurt of being the next, I'm not going to say Calvin Johnson, but one of, in. he has the potential to be a number one wide receiver in this league, and that's what we need from him. If we're able to get the production that I think is possible out of Kenny Gaudet and all this other stuff happens, obviously, lots of ifs, like I said, I think... Perfect. The Lions make the playoffs this year. If not, could be in for another bad ride. You think the Lions make the playoffs this year, but what is our collective prediction on their record? Yeah, so our collective prediction is 7-9, and nine, and that does not get them into the playoffs. You're right. So I, I would say being an optimist, if all the things happen that I think need to happen, that I think are possible to happen, they finish 10-6. and six. But that's a and lot of And they'd be the second wild card. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So... I think best case scenario, and I don't believe that the best case scenario is going to happen. Don't get me wrong. Best case scenario, like you said, second wild card team fighting for a road playoff win. Yeah, tough. Yeah. It's really hard to do when you have one of the hardest schedules. Exactly, exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. The Packers have one of the toughest schedules. The Lions have one of the toughest schedules, and it seems to happen like that all the time, especially playing in the NFC North. There's a Lions fan cliche for you right there. Yeah. I. Oh, yeah, we always have the toughest schedule. <laughs> you have the toughest schedule because you're a terrible team. There's no correlation to the fact that you're terrible to having a bad record. Please move on. Yeah, okay. We're, we are moving on to which uh, the team that I believe to be the lowest end of the NFC North, but it's possible that they could sneak ahead of the Lions or, or, or even the Packers, for that matter, and that is the Bears. Wes, I want to talk about the leader of this team, Mitch Trubisky. You know him better than any of us, and why is that? Sure, let's talk about that. I, I'm a UNC fan, and primarily because of their basketball, but I also enjoy watching their football because they do win maybe four games a year. And especially I enjoyed it when uh, when we had Mitchell Trubisky, and he only started for uh, one full season. But in that season, he was electric, threw dimes, threw long bombs, and was a very leader-like quarterback on the field. Mm. So when he's that young and he's still capable of that, I think he's he has a chance to be a very good, possibly elite quarterback in the NFL. The problem is the Bears aren't there yet. Oh, no. And there's a lot of gaps and empty spaces before they can win even seven games. So last year they won five games. They went 5-11. and 11. This year, I think they're in that same ballpark. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree. And I think that Trubisky, he honestly didn't have that poorly of a rookie year. You're right. And he was drafted number two overall, which there's lots of pressure that goes along with that. We'll definitely talk about rookie quarterbacks as we go along. But I envision Trubisky to have something of a sophomore slump, and here's why. He is he's under a new coaching staff, yes. and they're expecting a lot more out of him. He was a dink and dunker last year. And they're expecting to have him open up the field, which I can see being a good thing. However, his wide receiving core, mm-hmm. they, their, number t- their top two wide receivers are Allen Robinson and Kevin White. 
Allen Robinson is coming off a horrific injury played for Jacksonville, and Kevin White cannot stay healthy. So if those two guys go down again, they are screwed. Well, the Bears had a ton of injuries last year. They did. And that, maybe that's training staff. Maybe that's just a fluke. But having injuries like that really sets you back a lot, just culturally and because you don't have the players. So I, so I could, what if that happens again? What if what if a, an O-lineman goes down and Mitchell Trubisky is on his rear end a lot? I mm-hmm. mean, that's frustrating, especially when you're losing a lot of games. For a young guy to stay in there and try to keep winging the ball like Eli Manning does or Matthew Stafford does, that's tough to do. Right, most definitely. And I think one thing that is going to be big for Trubisky this year is the play of Jordan Howard. Jordan Howard as a rookie two years ago, phenomenal year. Last year, he slumped. He had that sophomore slump. But he's still a good. he was still a good running back. But I think if he's able to have a bounce back year like I expect him to, I think that's going to take a lot of the pressure off of Mitch, Mitch Trubisky because like we said, a good run game helps the pass game immensely. You know, I don't have much to say about the Bears. The only thing is they're going to be awful. <laughs> yeah. The sophomore slump is such a real thing. And with Mr. Trubisky not having a, that great of a rookie season, it's just going to be bad. It Worst team in, I'm going to say it, worst team in the NFC. And now in the entire NFC? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that, that's tough. So you think, what, three games they win? Yeah, three and 13. Okay. Um, aside from that, let's talk about, we have to, the Dick Butkus Award winner. The Dick Butkus Award winner. Yes, Roquan Smith out of Georgia was drafted by the Bears, and I think that is going to be a really bright spot for their defense. Uh, He was one of the best linebackers that I have ever seen at the collegiate level. And like I said, a bright spot, but on a defense that is not too many bright spots. One one other one that I would like to point out is the play of Leonard Floyd. Uh, He's their kind of... He's an in-betweener between a defensive end and an outside linebacker, and he can really get to the quarterback. He was kind of a surprise. They drafted him early a couple years ago, and he's been playing very well. But other than that, they are very, very unproven on that side of the ball. So that's just going to hurt Trubisky even more. Yeah, you're right. So let's give them our collective prediction on the record. Right, yep. We we went with 5-11. and Even could be a little generous. Generous, It could be. But you never know. If Trubisky plays well, if Jordan Howard has a bounce back year, if Allen Robinson is back to the player that he was in Jacksonville before getting injured, you never know. You you just never know. That's the thing about the NFL is you can't predict injuries. And it's bound to have a, you know, the few ACL tears. Or there's bound to be a bunch of injuries and you just can't predict it. So that rounds out our predictions and our thoughts on the NFC North I'm rooting for Kirk Cousins. Yeah, I mean, we all have to root for Kirk Cousins. He's a, first of all, he's a good guy. Yes. And uh, he's from the area. Yes. But he made a horrid decision on a college and a high school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Kirk. Easy, buddy. We we still want him to come on the show. Easy. We do. We do. Um, but yeah, I mean, this could be the difference with adding a couple offensive weapons. This could be the difference between losing in the playoffs and making it all the way to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, that they're the class of the North, and they are, they'll be able to compete with the Eagles of the world, that's for sure. That's right. So, PPs, that wraps up the NFC North stuff. But what we're going to do, we're going to move on to a brand new segment. This is something we haven't tried before. Let's do it. We're a podcast, but we're going to break the fifth wall here. We're opening up the, fo- the phone lines to any caller out there, any PP. Uh, oh, we got fo- one. We, we got one. He, he, somebody called. Who hello, is this? Hello, caller. Hi. What's your name? Miles Long. Oh, hello, Miles. Uh, w- do you have any takes for us? About the NFC North, specifically? Well, I just wanted to let you guys know that now, right now in July, I can already tell you that the Lions are going to win the NFC North this year. <laughs> really? So yeah. do we have to hang up the- on this guy now? <laughs> no. Hey, you think that they're going to be better than the Vikings? The Vikings, it's going to be a little treading around because they got Kirky now. It's a whole new quarterback. I know Case Keenum was new. But, I mean, they just kept the offense dumb for him, like, just to make it super basic. Right. Is there anything different between Case and Kirky? Well, I feel like Kirky's much better than Case, but it's still the whole learning curve, new offense, new system, new city. Right. I mean, it's closer to Michigan, so I may, I mean, he'll feel more like home, I guess, than playing for the Washington racial slurs. <laughs> but, I mean, 
I mean, it's, I think he'll be good, but I think the Lions will take both games against the Vikings. Wow. I mean, Even in Minnesota. In the, they play in the Dome. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, are the Bears going to be just god-awful? No, I think they're going to make a big improvement. Mitchell Trubisky is going to be better, okay. except they're still going to be last in the NFC North because <laughs> the NFC North is going to be so powerful this year. The NFC North is going to be really powerful. Now, what and are... I mean, I mean, the one game that I'm worried about for the Lions is Week 17 at Lambeau Field. I mean, it's going to be like negative 55 <laughs> degrees right. Celsius out there. Speaking of and... Green, speaking of Green Bay, what do you think about your boy Aaron Rodgers? Well, the second greatest Packers quarterback of all time. I mean, he's looking good coming in this year. I was worried about him when I was watching Shark Week last night. And he <laughs> yes. almost got his hand bit off. Right. <laughs> and he is kind of the leader of my fantasy team. So, I mean, I don't want his hand to get bit off by a shark. Wait, so are you keeping a quarterback in your fantasy football league? I am keeping my quarterback for back-to-back years now. And, and, how, and how is that going for you? I made it to the semifinals last year with by far the worst team in the league. So, <laughs> okay. I mean, it worked out pretty well. I'm still baffled that you have any confidence in the Lions at all. What? Where's your hope? Where's your hope lie in that team? In one person, Matthew Stafford. Oh, I thought you were going to say Matt Prater. Well, obviously him. I thought that was just kind of a given. So right, I right. gave you a hot take instead of Matt Prater. I gave you Matt Stafford. Right. Do, do they have enough weapons around Stafford? For, in order honestly, for them to be okay? Honestly, with with his dual threat ability, I think that he can just carry the ball for 500 yards. Maybe right. he'll hand it to our new rookie back. Yeah. Or the usual Lions rookie, like 100 carries, 450 yards, and three, tack- or three touchdowns. Right. But, I mean, I think Stafford will be fine this year. As long as we can keep him off his ass, we'll be good. Hey, Miles, you, you sound like a big Lions fan. Is this correct? This is this is correct. Yes, so, I was actually the only Detroit Lions fan while I was overseas in the entire country. You were overseas? Yes, I was overseas. I was in uh, North Korea for a while. <laughs> 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 so you're serving as a diplomat to the to the North Koreans? Yeah, Kim, Kim Jong and I are pretty good friends. So you're yeah. fam- he's familiar a, with he's a Bears fan though. He's oh, a okay. Bears fan. So yeah, yeah. So you're familiar with nukes and how. The Lions are going to be in nuke and just blow up and be bad. Oh. No, no, I'm I'm feeling like the Lions are going to be dropping a nuke on the NFL this year. Hey. All right, and every everyone's just going to be blown away by Stafco. Okay, Miles. One more thing. What did you think about the Frank Ragnow draft pick? Because it was a little. It met was met with a little bit of criticism. They reached big time on him. I mean, we could have gotten him in the second round. We had a decently early second round pick. I mean, I was watching tape on this guy, and he did not let a sack up during his entire college career. Right. And the only other person that they said that in the last, like, 15 years that has done that was uh, Joe Thomas for the Browns, and he just retired probably a first ballot Hall of Famer. Oh, yeah, he's easy. He he, he was okay. So, I mean, connecting the two dots together, I think uh, Frank is going to probably be a 12-year veteran for the Lions, maybe a few Super Bowl rings. Miles, are you familiar with our show? Yes, I am. So you probably love the Big Three segment. Yes, I do. What I'm going to do for you is I'm going to do a segment within this segment. I'm going to quick give you the Big Three of Matt's on the Lions. Mm. Number one, okay. obviously, I have to go Matt Prater. Then it's Matt Patricia. Then it's Matthew Stafford. Hey, if you had to yeah. rank the Matt's, Miles, what would you do? I would probably put Prater number one. Mm. I mean, he's Good probably the greatest player of all time. He might be. <laughs> and then... I would agree. I would agree with you guys with Matt Patricia at number two, because mm-hmm. I mean he's new. He's got to figure it out. I'm not really worried about Stafford. He's going to carry the team, so he's kind of the third important on the list. Right. I mean Patricia. Patricia's just got to figure out how to drive this new Corvette that he just picked up by coming to the Lions. Goodness gracious, the Corvettes are nice. I, I, I'm driving a CRV and it sucks. It, it's yeah. just, it's just not good. All right, Miles. I know what you mean. Miles. Thanks a lot for calling. First caller, how does it feel? It feels good. It feels good. I feel like I accomplished something by making it onto the show. You, you most definitely did. And we will definitely, you'll definitely have to call in again. Sound good? Sounds good, guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Long. All right, see you, Long. Well, Miles, thanks a lot for calling in. And Pierce, thanks a lot for coming on, man. It was awesome. We love talking football. Subscribe. You know the deal. Follow us on Instagram. Guys, peace out. Roll Tide. Football's Roll. back. Roll Tide.